think my relationship with the ocean started with my fascination with water. My family is from Iran, so my people come from the desert. A thing that was really big in our family was going on trips. When I was 11 or 12 years old, we went to the Virgin Islands and I saw a healthy coral reef for the first time and I think I lost my mind. It changed me forever. I'm Dr. Shreen Rahimi. I'm a marine anthropologist, underwater filmmaker, and National Geographic explorer. This is my neighborhood in South Beach, Miami, and it's an incredible place to live because we have clear waters that I can shoot in right offshore. This is the ocean right here. This is government cut. It's where all the cruise ships come in into this port, and a lot of sharks are in this very area. I did my PhD in marine anthropology, collecting data basically about how people interact with the ocean, both using images, so with my camera, and also with notes, and trying to understand how they're adapting to a quickly changing ocean because of climate change, uh, ecosystem degradation, pollution, all of these factors that we know are having a huge impact on marine ecosystems. I'm featured as a contributor on Shark Attack Files 2 for National Geographic Shark Fest. For this episode, I took a film crew out to Bahamian spearfishers that I've been working with for a few years now. When you're spearfishing underwater, blood is coming into the water and that attracts sharks. And so these spearfishers have come up with really ingenious techniques throughout generations to avoid sharks and to avoid getting bitten by sharks that might think that they are fish. Diving with sharks underwater in the ocean means accepting vulnerability. When you're down there, you're in their territory. Three months ago, I was filming shark tagging off the shores of Florida. I was underwater, and the scientists released a shark that had been on the hook that was getting tagged, and the shark swam at me and bit me right here in the chest. I went to the ER afterwards to get treated and the doctor just dabbed it with some salt water, gave me antibiotics and a tetanus shot and sent me on my way. It's actually worse to get bitten by a dog because dogs' mouths have a lot more bacteria than in them than sharks do. This is uh, my scar where the shark bit me and as you can see it went clean through my wetsuit so if, it, if I hadn't have had this on it probably would have been a lot worse. I often will team up with other scientists that have more expertise than me when I'm trying to tell a specific story. One of those people is Dr. Katherine McDonald. She's an incredible shark scientist doing really exciting and very thoughtful and, and caring work with sharks off of the shores of Miami. I'm Dr. Katherine McDonald. I'm the director of field school and I'm a lecturer at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami and I study juvenile and mesopredatory sharks. And what that means is that I study smaller bodied sharks that live their lives not only out there looking for food, um, but also trying to make sure that they don't get eaten. These sharks are such an important part of ecosystems and they are so much less studied and they receive so much less attention than the large apex predatory sharks. Baby sharks are just as cool as their parents. So right now Catherine is showing me the ropes with shark tagging. Um, we're putting out long lines, which are basically very long lines with 20 or so hooks attached to them. And on the end of each hook is a little piece of fish. And so that is gonna attract a lot of sharks. Yes. While we're waiting for these lines to soak, why don't I give you a tour? Let's do it. You can see on our depth finder there that we're just about nine feet deep. And the entire bay uh, on average is well under 20 feet deep. So people think of Biscayne Bay, which is quite a large body of water, they don't realize that it's also incredibly shallow and that makes it a really precious ecosystem, both in terms of that shallow water lets things like seagrass beds thrive and it lets small sharks avoid bigger sharks that don't want to be in such shallow water. So it's kind of like a refuge for baby sharks. Exactly. So everyone's singing about baby sharks, but why is it important for us to study them? So they play such an important role in food chains because when you think about the, the big sharks like the apex predatory hammerheads or uh, great whites, 
a big part of many of their diets are other sharks and rays. And so those mesopredators not only help keep ecosystems healthy, but also are an important food source for the sharks that people really uh, do historically care a lot about. If you care about the health of our oceans, if you care about the health of shark populations, you should care not just about the big guys, but about the little ones too. A lot of sharks are under grave threats. Their habitats are being destroyed, their food sources are being taken away by fishing. And so shark tagging is this tool that scientists have where they can gather all of this data about these sharks so that they can better protect them. The reason why I love working with Catherine is because she's so caring and deliberate with how she tags these sharks, and she really does not compromise on making sure that the sharks uh, are tagged in the most humane way possible. One of the things that I hope that my work will convey is that ecologically important spaces can be anywhere, can be in your backyard. And that means that people in Miami have the chance to take steps to ensure that uh, the sharks that live here and rely on this habitat stay healthy. I mean, and if there are no animals in this bay, it's lifeless. It doesn't function the way that it should. So your research is so incredible because you're gathering all this data, all these numbers, um, all this information about these animals so that we can make sure that they don't die out given all of the pressures that we're putting on them, right? And working out here and seeing these little sharks thriving even under these conditions, to me, it really helps put us in perspective as a piece of this landscape. So this is a bonnet head shark. Um, she's almost mature. And perfect. she looks kind of like a baby hammerhead, but it's not. So what they're doing right now is taking uh, biopsies. They're taking some blood samples from her and they put a tag on her um, and they're also, they have this pipe in her mouth running water over her gills so that she doesn't feel like she's suffocating while they're working her up. We're collecting data about who is giving birth, when, how big are the babies, and also questions like how's the bay doing right now? What's present in the waters you know, at this time of year in these temperatures? And uh, starting to collect a more holistic picture of the ecosystem here. She's pregnant, yes. Yeah. We're taking a quick picture of her on this grid board uh, that we're using to study the morphology of bonnet heads here in Biscayne Bay. All right, guys, bow team, let's get back to the bow. We might have more little sharks waiting for us. After I got bitten by that shark, when I called you up and you were like, I have the time, let's talk about it, you weren't just like a, you weren't just helpful in figuring, helping me figure out how to talk about the incident, but you were also helpful in helping me go through the fact that like these things happen, you know? Our risks are not the same as other people's risks. We work with these animals all the time. One of the things I tell my students is sharks don't want to bite us, right? We have to be so careful how we talk about it because I don't want to minimize like both the physical and the emotional experience of that happening. It's a lot. Uh, but you also don't want to fear monger around sharks, particularly since these kinds of events are so statistically rare. Looks like we got a shark on the line. It's so pretty! I know, it's so inspiring to be working side by side with Catherine, doing our best to help these sharks live and thrive in their habitat.